awesome panel here, which is the Sustainable Fashion Ecosystem, Rethinking the Fashion Business Model. Uh, and I just want to start by introducing the moderator, Rebecca Ballard, who's a dear friend. Um, Rebecca's a labor and employment lawyer turned into an ethical fashion designer. She has experience living and working across the U.S. and Asia, focusing on um, issues of labor rights and anti-trafficking. She is currently serving on the, I want to get this right, it's a very long name, the Forest Labor Working Group for the Commercial Customs Operations Advisory Committee, which is part of the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement and Department of Homeland Security. Very <laughs> <laughs> to see. Big deal. Um, Rebecca is the founder of Maven Women, which is an ethical and sustainable workwear brand based here in D.C., and she has made one of my favorite dresses. I'll let you introduce everyone else. Now? <laughs> okay, so good afternoon, everyone. We are after lunch. We've had an amazing morning and a lot of fantastic conversations that I'm excited for us to build on this afternoon with an incredible panel of some very knowledgeable people. So before we introduce ourselves, I actually thought it would be fun to get to know everyone here a little bit. So we'll just do kind of quickly by a show of hands um, to share a little bit about why you are here and, and who you are. So if you work in the university realm or are a student yourself, raise your hand. All right, awesome. If you work in the social sector world for a nonprofit or are highly engaged in a nonprofit in a board role or an advisor role, raise your hand. Okay, DC question. How many of you work for a government of any kind in any capacity? <coughs> All right, I, I see some people that are raising their hand more than once, which is interesting. <laughs> How many of you work in the private sector in any capacity? Raise your hand. And keep your hand up if you work for someone that you would consider to be a social enterprise. All right. Raise your hand if you have a job that you would say over 50% of your focus is related to fashion. All right, so I had this as we were around a lot of experts, very much the case. Um, all right, and raise your hand if 10 years ago you had heard the term eco-fashion. All right, that is a <laughs> teaser for what is going to be happening right after the panel. Um, fantastic. So, so I would love for things to be as interactive as possible and really build on the experience of these fantastic panels. So to get us started as a little icebreaker, I wanted to ask each of them to very quickly tell you their favorite item in their closet. You can read, um, I don't know, is it possible for us to put up the, the bios on the screen? So I think it's important for us to all have that information, but just to learn a little bit about what brings everyone into the fashion realm and what, what makes them excited. Should I start? Yeah. yeah. So my favorite, I had to think about that yesterday, and I, I think some of the items that have a more, I'm emotionally connected with are a couple of items that I brought back from my home country, Romania, that my mother and grandmother made at home, handmade, handwoven, hand knitted, you know, whatever you want to name that, and I'm still wearing them here, so that's what I'm I have a collection of silk slips and bed jackets and nightgowns that were actually my grandmother's that were a major inspiration for me to start a sleepwear work company. Hello everyone, I'm Kenya Wiley with the Fashion Innovation Alliance, and my favorite item is a vintage Comme des Garçons jacket, and it's not just that it's Comme des Garçons, it's that I got it when I worked at the MPA at an employee cell at one of the studio lots, and so the rumor is that that jacket actually belonged to Ellen DeGeneres, <laughs> that makes it even more special. <laughs> oh, and it's also the jacket that I'm wearing in my photos. Oh. <laughs> Hi, I'm Elizabeth Gibbons. I'm a stylist in D.C. and um, my favorite things are, they change often, um, but for the fall and winter it's usually the black Fonte pants by Dion von Furstenberg that I can throw on with everything. <laughs> and then um, for summer it's a, it's a blue dress that is an outfit by itself and I don't have to worry about adding anything to it. I'm Danielle and Kojo. Um, the favorite item, I didn't want to seem frivolous, but it is a pair of Manolo Blahnik <laughs> print flats that I found at Unique Thrift. 
and was like reaching for them and was nervous that someone was going to come flying <laughs> fighting for them. And I got them, and at the time I was running a resale business and I was selling things that I found like that. And I, it made me pause to say, I, I can have nice things too. So they are one of my most prized possessions. I will not wear them if it's going to rain. <laughs> or my children are going to eat ice cream that day. <laughs> So I thought that I would start off by painting a picture of what this industry looks like. We've done a great job this morning. I think, Whitney, you had a fantastic introduction, and everyone else has really built on that as to what does this industry look like? What is the size, the scale? What is it all about? How is it changing? How is it in flux? What did it used to look like? Mm -hmm. um, so just to remind everyone of some of the facts and also to engage a little bit with all of you. So we've talked about the fact that it's estimated that about a sixth of the world's population has a job related to this industry. So yes, that includes people that work in factories, that includes people who work on farms, it includes salespeople at stores, it includes models, photographers, people who are working in any capacity around raw materials, it includes shipping and logistics. We're going to be talking a little bit about what is in flux, who this industry is working for, and who might be struggling in this industry of all of those key players. It's created a tremendous amount of wealth. So the fourth richest person in the world is someone who works in fashion. His net worth is $84 billion. What company does he work for? Zara. Not H&M, not Zara. Can you got it? Bernard Alnott of LVMH. He is the richest person in fashion and the fourth richest person in the world. He has a net worth of eighty-four billion. He recently, I'm sorry, Selma Hayek's husband. I did not know that about him. All right. No, no, that's no, that's Karen. Okay. <laughs> Bernard Arnault recently beat out someone who is the founder of Inditex, the parent company of Zara, named Amancio Ortega. So then who is the wealthiest person in Sweden? What company does this person work for? We can probably guess that. What about, did anyone know that in Japan, the richest person is connected with fast retailing company? What well-known? Uniglo. Uniglo. All right. Awesome. You guys. I would not want to play trivia against any of them. <laughs> All right, geography. So we talked about China, at least at present, is the biggest exporter by quite a bit. Um, but it's followed closely by Bangladesh. What are the two other countries that are pretty neck and neck after India? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah. <laughs> not a good poker face. Okay, what's one of the other ones? Cambodia. Not Cambodia. Yeah. Vietnam. Yeah. Vietnam, although it's all in flux, so who knows where it's going to be going, and we'll talk some about that too. Um, right now, who knows what the most popular material is in the U.S. for clothing? Polyester. I heard some polyester, I heard some polyester. cotton. It is polyester. It used to be cotton. When did that switch over happen? 80s or 80s, 90s? So early 2000s. When it happened. Okay, so we've talked some about the fact that this is really a women's industry through and through. The majority of workers are women. The majority of supervisors are male. We have some incredible people here working on that issue. Um, and in the U.S., interestingly, most of the consumers, a little over 70% of the consumers, are women also. So it's really a women's industry. And one final kind of painting the picture thing before we turn it over to our awesome panelists. I wanted to talk a little bit about our clothing habits in the United States. So at the turn of the century in 1900, what percentage of the household budget was spent on clothing? Do you feel free to just shout things out? 10, 10, we have, I hear 10%? 25. 25. 30. 30. It is 14%. All right, let's fast forward to the 19, 1960s. So some things that have happened, we've gone through some wars. We have had the birth of a lot of synthetic materials. You're seeing things like silk stockings are now being made out of nylon. Um, so some technological changes. At that time period, what percent? It was 15% in 1900. What about in the 1960s? 30, 60, 30, 30, 12. <laughs> from 14 to 12. Right? What about in the early 2000s? 
Four. Someone got it. It's four. So that's also showing the arc that's happening in this country in terms of our spending. The average American household buys one clothing item per week. That is four times as much as 20 years ago. So we're having some exponential increases going on. Um, and the average household spend is about $2,000 in apparel. So this is this industry that we have. It's a huge industry. It's engaging a lot of people around the world. There's a lot of cultural and technological things going on in this industry. And globalization has impacted it in so many different ways. So I wanted to have our panel unpack some of that narrative for us a little bit. And first turn it over to Heidi to chat with us a little bit about some of the people and the groups that are doing well in this industry right now that are winners in terms of profitability, and then some of the groups that are struggling or as things are changing in this industry, who you might see kind of kind of falling out and why. Thank you. Um, when I was talking about my grandmother's slips, I didn't mention that I'm the founder of uh, Bella Boom Boom. We are a sleepwear, lingerie, intimate um, uh, company. I got my background working right around the corner at the Organization of American States doing development in Latin America and job training with the um, with uh, the, more of the informal sector, realized there was a big textile industry and have always been committed to keeping sourcing in the Americas, um, which is challenging, has been challenging. I am going to speak for more, I, the, we've had a lot of talk in the morning about the larger high street brands that, you know, by the sheer scale of making, have the ability to make huge impacts. I'm going to talk more from the perspective of a brand, a, a smaller brand, and what it takes to actually be in the ecosystem, the different ways to be um, part of it, and what the, those challenges are. So um, as far as the, uh, mostly focused on the market in the United States. So, so as far as winners, um, one of the winners that I would name right now is actually Amazon. I mean, Amazon is going to be um, the number one seller of apparel, and I recognize apparel is not always fashion, but it's part of the conversation that the guy heard too. Um, uh, expected to gross like $3 billion this year. And whether you are a brand that is sold directly to Amazon via Vendor Central, or whether you're selling whether you're selling direct to consumer via, via Seller Central, um, and they you know they own other things like Shopbop, which sort of brings fashion into the mix. Amazon is making money off of fashion, and the challenges that that has made to the market are sort of <coughs> part of the retail apocalypse and it's closing brick and mortar. So Amazon, I would consider a winner. Um, digitally native brands. I would consider winning or poised to win in, in the market. Brands that got their start not as wholesalers but direct to consumers that have been able to factor the, the shipping costs and the marketing costs, um, telling their great brand stories. And there's some really good ones that do great things, whether it's eco friendly leggings by you know, brands like Girlfriend or companies that have their. Brick and this, you know, this emerging con combo like the Warby, Warby Parker model, where there's the or the Bonobos or Mod Club, where you can go to the showroom and then get. They're not carrying the stock and all of the overhead, but so they're able to upfront tell the brand stories, invest in their brand stories. I would say they're, you know, a lot of them have VC dollars, so whether they're winning or not remains to be seen. But they're definitely poised. Um, in a different position than the, whole, the wholesalers. And then on, as part of that, and this isn't exactly a fashion brand, but the digital marketing platforms are winning. I mean, what it takes to, to get the eyeballs, get the traffic, get the cost per click, um, you know, all of these brands are paying Facebook, Instagram, Google AdWords, <coughs> Google, um, the product feeds to be discovered, which is a huge cost. And the budgets, um, yeah, you know, there's that tell, oh, I'm just going to promote, let me promote this post, let me do this. But the budgets are massive, and they are required at this point. And even, you know, even if you want to be seen, even on Amazon's, I mean, every single one of these platforms are pay-to-play at this point in order to get seen. 
Um, and then by extension of that, again, not a fashion, not, but the entire logistics platforms behind it, the DHLs of the world. I mean, you can buy from ASIS and get free delivery, free returns. Um, you know, the pressure of all of all of the brands to compete with Amazon Prime. I mean, those, you know, one thing I actually do like about Amazon is I'm a big fan of the U.S. postal system, and there has definitely been a renaissance of the U.S. postal system, which has been in peril, but like the delivery and the logistics are, are winning with the direct-to-consumer um, piece. Brands that are struggling are, um, you know, and a lot of them are, are ethically sourced. Brands that, uh, Brands that sell the Nordstrom, brands that have great brand stories but started as wholesalers that are either have really suffered from the closing of brick and mortar. I personally, we started as you know sleepwear loungewear for just women's apparel in general. Survived the recession in 2008 in the maturity space because my partner and I were having babies. It was a niche. There was not a lot of competition. You know. One would think that women buy the best for the babies; they would buy for them the best for themselves, which is actually not always the case. But the the um, the brick and mortar retailers, the lingerie <coughs> companies, the maternity stores, the the bra fitters, you know, that will I mean, that will take the time to perform the service to fit the bra. The, and people are like in the dressing rooms buying them. On Amazon um, and all everything that goes along with those human relationships of being able to tell a brand story, to touch and feel a garment in real life with these small retailers, and there are there are cities where there's still great small ones, but you know there's a lot of vacancies in a lot of places, and I think I definitely think there's going to be there is a retail renaissance that's starting to happen and pop ups and all that kind of stuff. But a massive impact as far as those. Oh, like a lot of, one of the challenges for me as a brand is, I mean, even my Nordstrom buyer, like these were selling relationships based on human experiences. I knew the buyer. They wanted to be by quality. They wanted to see everybody do, do well. And a lot of the, the buyers now are either absolutely, totally contracting because they've been trying to compete with the Amazons and the fast fashion of the world and there's constantly, there's huge amount of turnover or like a lot of them don't even go to the traditional shows anymore. Um, a lot of it is you fill out the spreadsheet and upload it and then by, you know, week five, if the sell through is good, then they nix this or they introduce that. And so it's like math and not really human relationships a lot on on um, some of these mass channels. And like you would think that a Nordstrom has the ability to curate and tell a story and promote, but everybody's scrambling right now. I do believe that they're gonna improve and I think that we're, I think there's a bit of a turnaround, but there's been, it's just really interesting how for me as a small brand, um, there's this change from human relationships to big data and I think, you know, but Kendra can speak to this, the brands that can use that big data are doing really well. And the thing that I forgot to say about Amazon as well, as they can pick you up, they can study all of the buying trends, and now they're launching their own lines as well. So like the data behind the shopping patterns now are, is, is a big challenge, and the people that can actually work that have the ability to win. <laughs> Thank you so much for that overview, Heidi. I think it's, it's important to think about just the spider web that this whole ecosystem is. Um, to flesh things out a bit more and to add some additional complexity, I wanted to turn to Kenny to talk about two topics. One, a question that's been in the room today, but I'm really excited to hear Kenny's answer, is we are um, living with the Trump administration right now. What is going to be happening over the next two to six years um, under, under the Trump administration in terms of this industry? Because this industry... They will all say it's, it's going to be impacted, it's being impacted. And then also to talk about another area of, um, of our expertise, I'd love to hear from you a little bit, Kenya, on technology and what's happening with technology and innovation. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I'm the founder of the Fashion Innovation Alliance, but before I did that, I spent many years, I'm an attorney by training, and I spent many years on Capitol Hill working for the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee. 
And at that time, I also had, it had to be anonymous because back then we always took ethics rules very seriously. <laughs> so I had an anonymous blog and it was called Fashion Culture. And I covered political and policy issues that impact the fashion industry. And you may recall that was around the time when the CFDA was in Washington. They were lobbying for copyright design for fashion protection. And then there was this other effort to revive the Garment Center in New York, um, and save the Garment Center. And so I would meet with them when they would come down to Washington and they would always ask, so what else is going on in the fashion industry? What else is going on in Washington that's impacting our industry? And so I would call and send emails. And then those calls and emails turned into a blog. And um, after I left the Hill, I did um, policy work for the Motion Picture Association. And I realized that in the same way that technology was disrupting the um, film and TV industries, it was doing the same for fashion. The only difference is that at the time when I was at MPA, it was actually hurting the film industry. But I thought that it was actually um, helping fashion. And so I left MPA to launch the Fashion Innovation Alliance around two years ago where we focus on policy, regulatory compliance, um, inclusion, political messaging, and then also strategic partnerships for companies in fashion, tech, and retail. And what we've noticed is that it's really all of these emerging technologies, whether we're talking about blockchain or uh, like Heidi is talking about um, data, data compliance, and like using all of that data to um, and combining that with AI to make recommendations to customers and then just the way that social media has exploded and all of that together I think has really helped brands that would have never had a platform before be able to connect with consumers. But with new technology also causes new problems. And so one of those problems, the hotspots that we're following right now and working with our companies on policy, on the policy side, data security and privacy, um, immigration is really hot right now. Um, deregulation um, is becoming a bigger issue in the current administration. And I won't get into details, but um, also um, confirmations for political appointees and also um, judicial nominees as well. So a lot of what I did on the Hill too, in addition to policy, I also had to work behind the scenes and vet um, political nominees and recommend to the senators on the committee if they should vote yay or nay. If issues came up, I would have to present that to the committee as well. So as far as top issues that we're working on, I would say our biggest pain point right now is immigration reform. And sometimes people say things on the campaign trail, and you know it's out there, but you think, no, it's not going to be that bad. And then the person gets elected and you realize, okay, I'm going to be busy for the next two, four years. And so one issue is, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with um, the International Entrepreneur Rule or the Startup Visa Rule? Anyone? Okay. I know Amy is, because we've worked with the oh, FDA oh. on that. And so there are so many different parts of immigration reform that are hitting the fashion industry right now. The focus has been on DACA. Um, which is still out there, um, but DACA, and I'm sure all of you, we should all know about DACA and what's happened with that, um, and I think the focus has been on that because that's what the media has focused on. But there's also the international entrepreneurial, and that came about during the Obama administration because Congress could not get a startup visa rule through where startup entrepreneurs could get a temporary visa for two and a half years Obama took it upon himself to create a rule for that. That rule went into effect around two years ago now. The Trump administration <coughs> said they were going to end it. Um, they sent a notice out. Um, we at the Fashion Innovation Alliance, we submitted oh, three rounds of comments now on urging the administration to keep the rule. Um, currently, um, the rule is in effect um, because uh, it's complicated. There's in the same way that there's a court ruling to, to keep DACA open, the same thing is going on with the startup visa rule. So we ended up partnering with Parsons at the New School, the Fashion Law Institute at Fordham Law School, and also the BFDA, to try to keep this rule in place. Because I don't know, how, how many of you have um, immigrant, uh, any workers that are on visas that work for you? 
Okay, and, and, and it's an issue, and especially if you think about um, academia, a lot of the companies that we work with, they're recruiting students who are right out of school, and so the ability to get top talent, and especially someone who's graduated from an FIT or a Parsons who's already here and they want to learn and stay, it, it takes a lot of effort, but if we had these other visa alternatives, it would make it easier. So you have DACA, you have the International Entrepreneurial Rule, and also the other visas like H-1Bs where the administration and even Congress, certain members of Congress are trying to say, well, we want you to stay or come to this country if you have a STEM degree. But if you think about it, a lot of the um, entrepreneurs and designers in fashion, I mean, they have background, they have a background in art and humanities. And so we're arguing that in the same way that you're trying to get more STEM graduates to come here and stay, we should be doing the same for the arts and humanities too. Another issue, the last one um, I'll touch upon and I won't get too <coughs> into it, is um, data security and privacy. So just about every company we're working with right now has some element of data analytics, um, as a way to engage with their customers. There's one company we're working with, Eurotech. Um, they're an AI company based in Paris, expanding to the US, and they use AI and data to analyze social media <coughs> images, and so they're able to use that information to tell brands like what's selling and what's not selling. So it's both for um, data collection, but it's also ways so that brands know what to buy, what to, what to push, and what not to push. So there's also a sustainability component to that. But you have these brands that are collecting these data, and even larger companies um, aren't really as mindful of the data security and privacy regulations because they'll say, oh, the Facebook lobbyists will take care of that, or that Twitter or Amazon, they have lobbyists going up to the hill. But they don't realize that those advocates um, are only focused on what, what matters to their companies. They can care less about your retail brand, your digital commerce brand, and while, um, yes, we have people who are marching, but while all this marching is going on, you have staffers on the Hill and in the administration who are working on privacy legislation as we speak today. Um, also, one last question. How many of you connect with customers, those that have brands or work in retail, how many of you connect with customers in Europe or California? Okay, so you have some, in the, if you have their information and you're storing it on your site or in a database, you still have to comply. And the same with California, and so what's going on is that as the administration, they're investigating Facebook and other tech companies, they're also looking at next steps to say, okay, it's not a matter of when a privacy bill is going to get through, but we're going to get one. And so it's up to companies right now to say what you want included, what you don't want included in a, in a privacy data security. So I think I covered a lot. I wanted to then take a moment to do a deeper dive for building out the ecosystem and then start talking more about how are we going to change this ecosystem and make it work for so many of the groups that we've been speaking about today and really for all of us. So I wanted to ask um, each of these speakers to just speak briefly, Danielle, talk a little bit about locally, what's going on in DC? What's happening with waste in this city? What does it look like and what can we um, what can we learn from that? What can we do about it? Elizabeth, I know you are very passionate about women's issues, work directly with a lot of women, and is also having a bird's eye view as to how this industry is impacting women. So just a very brief snapshot on how this historically engaged women, where we are, and where we're going. And then Mihai would love to hear a bit more about your grassroots experiences being on the ground internationally in communities of workers and what, what their lives are like. Um, let's just try and keep it all at five minutes, which I know is super short for all of that, um, but so we can get to a few other things. Hi. Um, I'm sorry I didn't fully introduce myself before. I'm Danielle Kojo. I actually am a city government employee. I work with the district's Department of Energy and Environment, and I'm a member of the Urban Sustainability Team. And I had the good fortune earlier this year in this very room to launch the district's first uh, textile initiative. We call it Rethread DC. 
Um, and some of you, I recognize some of the faces were here for that launch. And so it just makes me so glad to see this kind of energy <coughs> continuing in this room. Um, you've heard a lot today, and I know um, particularly Marissa shared a lot of information about the waste side. I always think when we think of that, you know, the arrows in the circle, like I'm the bottom pushing back up. <laughs> I'm that end of it. Um, and so I was thinking today of what I, I thought it would be most helpful for me to share is what's the role of a city or municipality in this ecosystem, right? It is an ecosystem that's truly an ecosystem. Um, and so um, one of the things that I think or the perspective that we can take is to focus on pro what I'm calling product stewardship in this area. Um, it's so interesting when you said Amazon, like I feel the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Uh, my broader role is waste and materials management. And so, you know, usually between, what is it, like November 22nd and like January 6th, right? Like, not a good look. Like, there are Amazon boxes everywhere. And while I know it's not a large part of their profitability, not as much as the things that they sell, but guess who handles their waste, right? So the city is the person who handles your textile waste. When we talk about people throwing away between 70 and 80 pounds of clothing a year, that cost isn't borne by the producers. It is borne by the local tax base, quite honestly. And so um, if you live in D.C., if you live in a municipality that provides service, and most of us do, um, you're managing the other end of that. So when we talk about the cost, this is something that isn't calculated in, and I don't mean to pick on Amazon, right? But it is a, a, a very visible uh, player in this space um, that brands aren't, don't have to calculate the end of life cost for their products. Um, in the last two or three years, we've actually passed laws here in DC around product stewardship and extended producer responsibility. So if you buy a laptop um, in any retail location in the D.C., you are at the point of sale supposed to be told <coughs> what you can do with that laptop, your options for disposing of that laptop when you're finished with it. Uh, we have that for paint and for electronics right now. And anyone who sells into the district is responsible for taking back a certain percentage of what they sell by weight. Um, I think this is something where we, if, when we're forward looking about this, that we need to start talking to some of our uh, textile producers and manufacturers about that end of their system. And it's not just take it back and you know, kind of make it go away, but there's the opportunity for those materials to be feedstocks into remanufacturing, re um, upcycling, refashioning, we have all these different words for it. Uh, but I think that's the, the role that we can play. And so I look at it as what we're trying to do here is increase uh, producer responsibility, but also consumer responsibility. Uh, the ReThread initiative is to educate the, the residents and not just limited to the District of Columbia, but certainly this area as to, you know, what goes into making your garments and what is the true cost of that garment and then where are your resources for repairing, right? Like everybody's forgotten how to sew on a button. Uh, but repairing, upcycling, particularly donating those items. Um, that can be reused. We estimate that about 90% of what those 80 pounds that people are throwing away um, still have a useful life. And so we want to help people and, and businesses, right, capture that. <coughs> we think there's also the opportunity here for economic uh, development and enterprise, local enterprise development in the reuse of those materials. And so um, that's what we're really trying to do with ReThread in the district and kind of, again, be that, like, bottom part of the circle, pushing things back up. Very, very cool. Um, so um, I guess I'm here to, to talk about women's role in the fashion industry, and I also uh, have a, a fashion styling business and rely a lot on vintage, which um, helps to save clothes from landfills and also um, helps people to reinvent old pieces that have meaning to them. Um, but women's role in fashion, it's, uh, it's been, you know, time immemorial. Women were the weavers and producers of cloth. You see the women's role upstairs in the Colleen exhibit. Um, and in this country, women first started being able to go to work in force, in mass, when um, fashion industrialized um, in the early 1900s, I mean, 1800s, excuse me. 
um, in Massachusetts and in the Northeast in general. Those were the first kind of jobs that women actually could have outside of their home um, and could support themselves and have some income for themselves. Um, and it, unfortunately, um, women's role in that industry and their um, productive capacity was underappreciated and women were not kept safe and there were a lot of um, industrial catastrophes, including the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory disaster that was about 100 years ago. Um, the similar things are happening in the developing world now, um, where women are starting to be able to get jobs outside the home. They're starting to be able to work in textile factories and garment factories. And um, similarly, they are um, their safety is undervalued. Their, um, their lives are undervalued. They are often working in cramped, really hot conditions. There are episodes where 1,200 women in a factory faint at the same time because it's too hot. They haven't eaten. They might be saving all their money for their family and not spending it on food for themselves. So in one sense, the, the industry is... Um, helping women by getting them jobs outside the home and their first independence, their first taste of independence. But in other ways, um, uh, it speaks to the condition of women that um, companies undervalue their work <coughs> and their safety. So I think they're winners and losers. Also on the high end, if you think about models, um, I've worked, I've, I've, I'm a stylist, so I've worked at um, Fashion Week and um, it's kind of demeaning. I mean, the models are beautiful, and they enjoy being beautiful, and they should, but um, at the same time, they're treated like glorified hangers, and they are shuffled around like, like a little herd, and basically yanked and pulled and everything while they're getting prepared to show the clothes, not to mention that they can't eat, a lot of them can't eat very much. Um, some of them are naturally that thin, but others have to really starve themselves essentially to be thin enough to, to be in the fashion shows. Um, and then there's the consumer, which I think is another um, person in the whole ecosystem that can get exploited. Um, because basically fashion is, um, it's, a, it's an industry based on desire and fantasy. Um, we all need clothes, but we all want to adore ourselves. That's a human value, and it, it's something that everyone, every society does. We all adorn ourselves. We all want to look nice. But we get exploited because we're told that we have to have a certain type of item this season, a certain type of item the next season, and it just keeps changing and changing. And so what are we to do when... You know, we we're trying to pay for our health insurance and our rent, and we have to buy clothes at the same time. So I think um, a lot of what we've been talking about, the change starts with the consumer because the consumer can, can learn. Um, that's the kind of work that I do, is teaching people how to use and reuse what they have and how to evolve their wardrobe slowly over time and how to choose things that are really well made that are, that are going to last um, instead of choosing to buy bulk in huge quantities and, and then showing it off on a video online somewhere. Um, it's really satisfying to wear things that you've had for a long time that you, that you really picked out with love and passion and that you know are really precious items to you. And, um, I, I think it's very worthwhile to learn also about history and about cultures and to use those as your inspiration in getting dressed so that you have fun with it and make your own statement, not one that is driven by marketing or the data that um, some of the other panelists were talking about. You know, be your own self. You know, don't use autocorrect, <coughs> the autocorrect version of dr getting dressed, you know, buying what's out there. Think of think for yourself and, and enjoy it. That's what I have. <laughs> Just to give you a bit of background about why I'm here. So I do a lot of work in social impact and social entrepreneurship, 
And through that, because of that interest, about a year ago, uh, I co-founded Mosaic, which is a social business working with weavers in Guatemala, and we recently started a pilot project in Romania. So everything that we do related to fashion comes from a social impact perspective, and it's mainly about supporting uh, the producers and then, you know, looking at the consumers here. And I think it was Whitney in the morning that mentioned 60% of what's producing in the fashion industry comes from home uh, settings. And that's what we realized. Uh, I mean, we knew and really see it on, saw it on the ground both in Guatemala and Romania. And uh, I think, you know, the discussions that we had here since nine this morning, it's extremely interesting and educating, but we really need to be aware that this is a bubble, and this is a bubble within the US bubble, but once you step out of these bubbles, the situation changes, and it's nice to talk about recycling and secondhand store, but for example, you know, just to give an example in Guatemala, recycling has a completely different meaning there. People are literally selling their traditional outfits for 10 quetzales, which is a dollar and a half, because they need to feed their kids. Yeah. And if you follow the chain, the same cloth, or you know, it's turned into a bag, or just a nice blouse here in the US on Instagram, you can, I mean, you buy it for 200 bucks, and the story that is created around that piece it's unbelievably fake. So it's not only about fake products, somebody mentioned in the morning, it's about also the story that surround that product. And uh, I was looking, <coughs> doing my homework last night about you know the losers, and I, I think uh, there is a McKenzie report saying that 20% of fashion uh, players created 100% of the economic profit, and uh, the bottom 20 went backwards. And they are talk mainly talking about uh, mid-market players and small market players. And that's what we are, those are the organizations and the individuals we are working with both in Romania and Guatemala. So I think, you know, it's, um, we need to be aware that uh, the greenwashing concept is not only about greenwashing concept, uh, greenwashing, it's about sustainability washing, it's about ethical washing. I mean, all these concepts are, I think, in, I'm sure initially were created to educate and inform people and, you know, change the world, the world. But I think nowadays they've been so empty of content that it's very hard to uh, actually make sure that when you buy a piece, you know, a shirt or, you know, shoes, they are actually the story that comes with that item is actually true. And working with my uh, business partner, you know, trying to come up with a, I don't want to say a new narrative, but adapt uh, the narrative to be as, uh, to reflect the situation on the ground. And that that's, has been extremely hard because everyone, I mean, no one has time to uh, actually, you know, you see an item on Instagram or, you know, you go to all the stores and you like it, you buy it. You don't actually spend time, somebody mentioned in the morning, go um, wait 24 hours and then go back and buy it. How many of us are doing that? I mean, that's very rare. You just, you like it, you buy it. Even if you know you're gonna wear it only once. And I think, you know, but the packaging, it's so uh, nice and it catches your eye that you lose, uh, you know, why exactly, you don't think about the impact. <coughs> and, uh, you know, that we noticed that in Guatemala, we've been there for a year, and now in Romania as well, we are looking, we are working with uh, sheep farmers, and most of the wool they produce, uh, it's at best, and uh, is landfilled or burned. So what we are trying to do there is 
connect them to local weavers, so you know, create a structure, create an infrastructure, and actually you know, have an impact. Thank you, I think you have so I just wanted to ask everyone one more question. Um, take 60 seconds or less, which I know is really fast. Um, but what three aspects of the ecosystem would you change to make it a sustainable fashion ecosystem? And then we can move to a few audience questions. like to see, again, I'm in the world of the buyers that are buying from other brands, ask for more rigorous compliance data from their suppliers, and then either give credits or uh, some way of listing online, you know, this cost this because this is that story. Typically, brands need to pay to tell that story or there's no space. Um, you know, the ingredients label we've all been talking about on the garment would be amazing and you know very far down the road but ways to be able to tell, educate the consumer on the floor would be great and I'm gonna cut it from there because I think I'm over 60. <laughs> I've noticed that there's this not necessarily a trend it's always been around in fashion so it's, it's just been a lot of resources on PR and marketing so what I would like to see change is for brands and designers to spend less of their financial resources on PR and marketing and more on legal compliance, supply chain management, sustainability, ethics, the list goes on and on. Um, I, going back to the product stewardship, I think something as simple as a collection in the same store where you bought the item if nothing else, it just uh, raises your own awareness, right? That instead of burying things in the back of your closet, you're pulling them out. And so I think it reminds people, A, of what they have. And also, um, I think the brand will be get, get some information about what's coming back in their doors. I think um, a, a, a de-emphasis on speed to market, in other words, um, having slower supply chains and slower um, expectations of delivery would, act, would very much help these workers in these um, developing countries to have normal working hours and not be pressured and to get paid on time. Um, and I also think the consumer can, as I said before, have fun with their clothes and experiment with them and see how you can reflect the current mood and fashion by reusing what you already have. And I think, you know, what we learned in Mosaic was that, you know, there are so many tools like fair trade certifications and so on. I think we need more of that, that will look into very different aspects uh, that the fashion industry includes. And we've been talking of creating something like that in Romania, you know, it's, it's about giving a tool to the artisans and you know something like me as a consumer as a buyer would be able to check and track the entire process that's a great segue Mihai, into one of our questions so this comes from emily in the cloud i've noticed that terms such as eco green and sustainable have lost their original intent and meaning amid marketing campaigns by big brands what do you think is the next step beyond using these exhausted terms to communicate ethical practices I, I think it would be transparency. I, I don't know how would you is able to enforce that, uh, but you know, as consumers, as producers, as people involved in this industry, you know, just make sure that everything is extremely transparent. I agree. Transparency would be would be huge to help, and um, I also think that um, again. Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Okay. So it's um, the terms of eco green and sustainable that's been used for yeah. the big businesses. I think that um, companies, there are solid companies out there that don't use these words all the time that actually show them in their work all the time. Mm. Um, one of them would be um, Stella McCartney. She she doesn't use any leather or um, any animal products, and she does it over and over and over again. And she doesn't talk about herself as being an eco-designer. She is one, though. I think something 
anything like that. Having integrity from the bottom up is, is more important. So I think I'll just end um, in a closing question. Are there any more audience burning questions out there? Right, so just a closing. Oh. I hadn't heard anybody really talk about the fabrics themselves, like the organic cotton and the hemp and bamboo, and I was just wondering what you guys think about all of that. The fabrics and the sustainable ecosystem. Sorry, I just got back from Guatemala, so I'm just thinking about fabrics and what, what uh, we are trying to do at Mosaic is, you know, make sure that we can track everything. For example, we started engaging with a network of 25 users, uh, weavers, sorry, uh, close to the border with Mexico. And the reason we went that far from the capital is that <coughs> that network and the coordinator, who's also a weaver, can actually demonstrate and show the entire production process from the factory where he buys the threads, how they dye, how they dyed the threads, um, how he supports actually the artisans, uh, you know, all these small things that for us are extremely important. That we are there. And I can speak to this in terms of the, the trade element. Um, I work in countries uh, in South America where the raw material, where mm -hmm. our products are, the raw materials are sourced and produced in the same, in, you know, in the same country. So in Peru, for example, granted there are a lot of problems with cotton, but what we're seeing now is, you know, this is a country that had big contracts with uh, the Giorgio Armani's and all kinds of, um, brands that are losing them to more opaque supply supply chains. And so one thing that's happening is like filament for rayon and things like that are being imported. Laces that are not, Colombia's huge in laces. They're importing all these cheap laces. So they may not be the most eco-friendly products in the world, but at least they're not draining the other industries in the country. And once you drain those industries, uh, the ability to regulate minimum wage and establish um, protections in the sector if the country is just losing the demand in that particular sector it it goes down and there's a huge amount of dumping of raw materials in places like the Americas in an effort to like try to contain try to be competitive as far as pricing in the world yeah. Yeah. We talked about the ecosystem. I'm a small designer, but I also have 20 years of um, experience uh, working in corporate retail. So I know both sides of it. Um, and as a small designer who I'm working with nonprofit organizations, uh, similar, uh, working with hand weavers in India and also hand weavers in Bolivia. Um, and I feel like when we talk about brands, it, it, it can be, I really think the question is retailers who we sell wholesale to them. So we talk about our living wage and cost of goods and trying to have um, protect our artisans as well as make a sustainable company here. Um, but when we sell to retailers who then wholesale, like a Nordstrom, we don't, I don't feel as if they're an antiquated model. Um, they're still asking us as designers and makers for large discounts, um, net terms. That means we don't get paid um, 60 days as norm. Um, and then we have to pay our weavers our factories all up front. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, I feel like it's a system that's broken, that we have one end where you're educating consumers, um, you know, we are cutting our costs and we're cutting um, you know, our, our waste as much as we can. But we, I feel like it's, it's you know, swimming upstream mm -hmm. um, to buyers that I also need to, to buy from me so that I can pay my artisans. So I'm not sure in Heidi or anyone else in terms of your experience, you know, how how it's been in terms of healing more of the retailers. Because I feel like they're not the ones. I mean, H&M is vertical or so forth and Zara, they can do these things. Um, <coughs> but I feel like everyone else in that sense, like the Bloomingdale's or Barney's who wants an exclusive, um, it cuts you off and wants, you know, 50 minutes of, of one thing, who you need maybe for brand awareness, but then you're also working under their terms. So I feel like everyone on the other side is modifying their behavior, their spending, but I feel like the people who have the power are not, and still kind of lopping us off at the knee. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, I totally agree with you. <laughs> um, that 
I was trying to refer to that earlier, is the buyers really need to be educated. I mean, we sell to the Chicos of the world who, they're actually, in comparison, are better for requiring compliance value. Um, you know, from the morning conversations, there's a lot of ways to sort of pr prove your certification or the factory certification once a year and then things slip from there. But, but that I was referring to that a lot of these, and I think actually Nordstrom needs to be part of the renaissance. That, you know, they have the first piano players in the stores, the whole experiential yeah. thing. And I do believe that they're going to get it together. But I keep saying, I keep referring to them because they typically had a high bar. But they're scrambling so much because buyers are changing and it's all of sell-through data. And they're really actually moving towards dropship models yeah, and things right. like that yeah. where anybody, I mean, it, with very little criteria for the brands that right. they that they let on their platforms. Um, and so that does need to improve. And that's what I was saying is like back in the day, if you want to be in the Nordstrom cat catalog, you had merchandising money that was either paid up front or taken from your margins. Um, and I think there could be a little checkbox that tells a little bit more of those stories. And this cost this because of this reason. But absolutely, the turnover in terms of buyers and the education in terms of buyers needs to change. And the, it's the human relationships piece and maybe some credits or a little bit of, I mean, even even Amazon, I mean, they're, they are so flooded with so much garbage. But I don't think it would be that difficult for their CSR program to like come up with some sort of a little standard. If you want to tell your brand story right now, you either pay Amazon marketing services, you get like a little line item where you can say, oh, we're having, you know, this, you can, or you can pay to have like a brand page. But they could easily have a sort by, you know, somehow accredited fair labor practicing brands with X criteria. I know it's hard to prove the criteria, but that, it would be a start. And those are easy things that I would happen, but I'm clearly with you on the buyers and the terms. I just oh, sorry. to add, I'm mm -hmm. coming from the tech, my tech background in fashion tech, I don't know if you've thought about just rearranging or rethinking your strategy about working with big retailers. And the reason I bring that up is because some of our startups have been very successful, they're B2B, but they're partnering with other brands and they have their items on different platforms so that they don't have to compete with the Nordstroms and the Macy's and the Boondells of the world. They've been able to work around that. Um, another great company I like is 19th Amendment. I don't know if you're familiar with their platform, so that's another option. Well, thank you to all of you fantastic panelists, and I hope that this is really just a continuation of the conversation. This room has incredible talent and insight, and I'm so grateful to the DC Sustainable Fashion Collective for bringing us all together, panelists, for giving of your time, and hopefully um, the conversation can continue today and onward, because there's so much expertise in this room, and there's so much in this ecosystem that is right for transformation and for reformation. But as we've talked about, it's an industry that is very entrenched. It's an industry where it's really, really hard when you have people who have tremendous power, tremendous wealth, tremendous resources, and this whole spider web of connections in this industry. It's such a global industry in a really complex time. So thank you, everyone. Um, and I just wanted to take a moment.